Vicki and Kevin, Marsha, Barbara, and family, thank you for having us all here to celebrate the lives of Scott and Kendra. Scott and I met in high school, junior high school actually, in Berkeley. And we became close friends all through high school and onward. We have a couple of other Berkeley High good friends, Bill, Leo, that are here today. We spent every lunch playing hearts in the Melbourne Iguana Hearts Club at Berkeley High School. Breaking the rules, we found a teacher that would let us do this. But thinking back to the many experiences I had with Scott, it's not surprising to many of you that it was car-related experiences that really stand out to me in my memory. I'm going to relate a few of those. I can't relate all of them. Marsha runs a tight ship. I don't have time to give you all of these. But I'll take, I'll take you to a few. I'm going to start in 1976 when we were in high school. We were 16 or 17 years old. Scott and I, both being into cars, we decided we needed to drag the main like they did in American Graffiti. Well, that doesn't happen in Berkeley. There's no way. But we figured it out. One evening, one Friday night, we took the Chance family Honda drove out to Walnut Creek. Scott had his cassette of race car sounds blaring through the speakers. No surprise, right? I had a motorcycle, I had my motorcycle helmet on as we drove up and down the street with these Walnut Creek and was looking at who are these guys. It was major geekiness that reflected who we were then and who we would continue to be throughout our lives. Moving ahead a couple of years into 1979, Scott and Leo and I went to the Reno Air Races in Leo's 1963 VW Bug. We saw one of the most famous airplane race crashes back then of the Red Baron P-51 Mustang with counter-rotating props and amazingly the pilot Steve Hinton survived. And I'm giving you all this detail because Scott would have loved that detail and he would have corrected me on about half of it because I might have been wrong. I exchanged some messages with Marcia that we'd probably hear airplanes here today. Scott and I shared a passion for flying also, and we went to a lot of air shows together. But later that same year, 1979, Scott and another high school friend, Sam Bradley, and I drove to Baja, California. During Christmas break, driving the Chan family's old Chevy Impala, this giant beast of a car. But fuel prices didn't matter back then. We drove halfway down the Baja Peninsula, and a big rain, a flash rainstorm came and the flash floods blew out the, uh, the one roadway, Highway 1, that crosses the Baja Peninsula. We waited all through the night, hoping that the rains would subside, hoping that the river would subside. The army came out, they kept pouring gasoline onto the cactus plants to stay warm through the night. We pretty quickly realized we weren't going to make it down to the beaches of Baja. So we turned around and we went to Death Valley. And there we were, camping in Furnace Creek, 200 feet below sea level. We woke up the next morning in our t-shirts and shorts we'd been planning to take to Baja, and all of our water was frozen. <laughs> That's Death Valley in December. Not where we planned to be, but I have fond memories of it. We headed up 395 to Lake Tahoe. That was really the best way to come back over the ridge. And there we were again, Lake Tahoe, in December, in our t-shirt and shorts, in the big Impala, <laughs> driving back home. Scott's family was foolish enough to let us actually use that Impala again the next year, to try again. Thank you for that. <laughs> and this time, without Sam, we actually made it. And we had a great week of snorkeling and hanging out on the beach in Mulahe. It was a great trip. This past weekend, I happened to be driving up to the Sierras through Highway 50 in Sacramento, and I saw smoke trails up in the air, and I saw stunt planes, and it was a Mather Air Base show, and I remember that about 15 years ago, Scott and I had driven up separately, but met at the Mather Air Base for their annual air show, and I actually got to get into the Lotus, and barely fit myself into the Lotus, <laughs> and get to drive it around. That was great fun. Coming to more recently, in 2019, this last April, Last day of the ski season, Scott and I decided that we would go skiing. That Friday afternoon, after school let out, he drove up to my house in Piedmont. I took him inside, showed him the models I had, little models of all the cars and motorcycles I've ever owned. But I did that because I remembered that he had this on the mantelpiece in your house. And I always loved that. On the way up, we drove through the Delta. 
And we drove through Locke, and Scott said, let's go drive the, the, the main street, the old main street in Locke, because my father worked summers as a child on an orchard as a fruit picker here. So I'd never heard that story before. We had great fun skiing together, trying to keep up with Scott, who just bombed straight down the slope. But I could always pick him out because he was the only one wearing a onesie red ski suit from the 1980s. <laughs> Driving home that Sunday evening on Highway 50 in Sacramento, I told Scott, hey, you've got this great new Model 3 Tesla car, autopilot, I need to try that out. We did a quick charging in Folsom, and I'm driving along in Highway 50. All of a sudden, the car ahead of me just swerves over into the fast lane, pushing somebody into another lane. I'm thinking, why is this? Police cars are passing us. There's a helicopter flying in front. There's a car driving straight at me in our lane on the freeway going the wrong way, 70 miles an hour. I grab the steering wheel, disables autopilot, I swerve over, the car goes racing past us. <coughs> Scott and I are just going, what the heck just happened? We kind of regain our composure and Scott says, wait a minute, I've got all this on camera. In fact, I've got it on five cameras spread around the car and he pulls out the SD card. <laughs> right then and then he pulls out his laptop and he starts editing away to a great 30 second video, which he immediately posted onto the Tesla driver's owner's page saying, what would autopilot do? <laughs> it wouldn't have been pretty. I'll miss sending my annual Go Bears, Beat Stanford message to Scott before the big game. But he will be there rooting for the, uh, the Indians. No, no, it's the trees. Uh, it's the Cardinal, whatever they call themselves down on the farm there now. We'll miss you, Scott and Kendra. But we'll continue the adventures in your memory. Thank you. forward-looking, adventurous, and a tad irreverent. Those are the words Stanford's president used to describe the Stanford spirit. Those are the words I would use to describe Scott and Kendra. Forward-looking, adventurous, and a tad irreverent. My name is Lou Armstrong. I met Scott 42 years ago, the day we arrived at Stanford. I was assigned a triple room at Branner while Scott had the single room next door. Even though we weren't in the same room, he effectively became our fourth roommate, even wiring his phone to our landline so he could save money. <laughs> we had a memorable freshman year, starting with a celebration of our resident advisor's birthday. RRA Duncan, however, would not be there that night because he had to study for a test and he told us he would be out very late. At least he told us he was studying for a test. So we decided we would tape record a birthday greeting for him. But we didn't want to leave the tape recorder at his door where he'd have to manually start the tape recorder. No, that's too simple. We decided we would break into his room and we put the tape recorder in a closet with the door slightly ajar. Scott then ran wires from the tape recorder to the bottom of Duncan's bed and attached them to the coils, the bed spring coils on metal plates about well, that far apart. When Duncan came home that night, he of course jumped into bed, he compressed the metal coils, completed the circuit, the tape recorder then went off and wished him a happy birthday coming from his closet. <laughs> He then jumped out of bed, checked the closet thinking we would be in there at three in the morning. We weren't. But the, it also had the wonderful effect that the coils then oops, excuse me, separated and the tape recorder stopped so he didn't see anything in the closet. He goes back to bed. <laughs> You've got it. The coils recompress. We had a second happy birthday on there because we knew he would do this. When we arrived at his room the next morning, we found his closet completely empty, clothes thrown everywhere because he was determined to find that tape recorder. <laughs> I think that was Scott's first true electrical engineering project. <laughs> then there was the tale of the water balloon launcher. One afternoon, we were sitting in our hallway at Branner, and by the way, there are several other Brannerites here who can share that story with you. Um, and Scott walks in with 30 feet of surgical tubing and a cup. We were baffled. We did not know what he had in mind with this, but he showed us how if we took the surgical tubing and ran it through holes in the cup, we could create a giant slingshot. Now this slingshot took three people to operate, one person on each end of the surgical tubing while a third person pulled back as far as they could, and you could load a water balloon in that, and we learned to have that water balloon sail 100 yards. 
Now, we needed a target, of course, for our water balloon, and we chose the dorm across the street, Wilbur Hall, is our target. And uh, we would practice on them every night as they came home from the library. And it, it wasn't long before they decided they would create their own water balloon launcher, and this led to the short-lived but epic water balloon battle of 1977. <laughs> Now, there's a follow-up to this story that involves the Stanford-UC Berkeley football game, otherwise known as the big game. But as I look out in the audience, I see far too many UC Berkeley grads here. So I'm going to hold off on that story, but if you'd like to hear it, I'm glad to share it with you later. <laughs> now, my freshman year stories make it sound like Scott was just a clever, another clever freshman. He was far more, even at the age of 17. Forward-looking, he wrote to the Stanford Daily condemning anti-immigrant sentiment, and he was deeply concerned about our environment. I also fondly remember conversations ranging from technology to art, history, and economics. Our relationship continued after college. It's so easy to lose touch with your college friends, but Scott refused to let that happen, and I am grateful. I with our lives continue to move in parallel. We both married, our daughter studied marine science, we worked for technology companies, and when we quote unquote retired, we became high school teachers. Scott taught AP Physics, while I teach AP Calculus and Physics. And even though my wife and I, Cindy, my wife Cindy and I live in Kentucky, I could always count on talking with Scott at least once a month, hearing about his neutrino research, or more recently his volunteer efforts into more or less taking his mother to Stanford basketball games, his pride in Vicky's living classroom program, Kevin's powerful perpetual foreigner video, and of course, Kendra's marine science work. Scott may never have realized it, but he also had an impact on the lives of my physics students. He is responsible for one of their favorite days of the school year. It's a day when we study projectile motion. <laughs> <laughs> and we take out 30 feet of surgical tubing, a cup, and water balloons, and test vec the vector motion. <laughs> Forward-looking, adventurous, a tad irreverent, and I would add compassionate. I am blessed that Scott was a close friend for 42 years, and he will be in my thoughts forever. My name is Philip Manella. I met Scott in 1983 when I took a job with the processor and memory group at Tandem Computers. Scott had arrived there a short time before me. We were both single. We were both Stanford graduates. It was the second engineering job for each of us. Scott had done an internship at Philips in the Netherlands, while I had done a short stint working for the phone company in New Jersey. We were coworkers who became friends. One of the things that attracted me to Scott was his passion for outdoor activities. Scott enjoyed lunchtime runs around the Tandem and HP campuses, now the Apple spaceship. Scott was a strong cyclist who I would struggle to keep up with. And he loved skiing, an intriguing activity for me, someone who had grown up on the Texas Gulf Coast. I remember multiple ski trips to South Lake Tahoe where Scott hosted the processor and memory group at Chanco, his family's cabin at Heavenly Valley. While working at Tandem, we each got married, bought our first homes, and started families. I was honored to attend Scott and Vicki's wedding at Tilden Park. Scott was a terrific engineer. He was one of those rare engineers who is equally comfortable working at the chip, board, and system levels. He was the sort of engineer who would be asked to go put out fires, which means to help solve those critical problems that can make or break a technology company. At Tandem, Scott played a major role in the design of fault-tolerant systems that ran banks, stock exchanges, databases, ATM networks, and the point-of-sale terminals that are so common today. Always the versatile engineer, he worked on sequencers, memory systems, and data paths. 
these were pioneering systems with names like TXP, VLX, and Cyclone. During the 1990s, we again found ourselves working together, this time with Silicon Graphics. At SGI, Scott helped develop the technology that would make possible the computer animations behind movies like Jurassic Park and The Matrix. These were machines with cool code names like Mardi Gras and Odyssey. These same machines enabled doctors to interpret the huge 3D data sets that were produced by CT scans and MRIs. So it wasn't all about movies and video games. <coughs> After SGI, Scott went to work at a little startup named Juniper Networks, a company that was making a bid to challenge Cisco systems in the computer networking space. Scott encouraged me to join him there, recognizing it as a great opportunity. I didn't make the leap, but in hindsight, I wish I had. That little startup achieved a market cap of $75 billion a little over a year after it was taken public. If I had followed Scott's advice, I might have been able to retire years earlier than I eventually did. Scott wasn't just a terrific engineer. He was an example and a mentor to others. He had a, the ability to recognize talent and would go out of his way to create opportunities for others to enhance their career development. He did this at Tandem where he encouraged the bright lab tech to become involved in design engineering. And that same desire to create opportunities for others certainly played a role in Scott's later decision to become a high school physics teacher. It was an honor for me to know and to work with Scott, and I'm gonna miss him. I was very honored to be asked to share my thoughts at the celebration of Scott and Kendra's life. We're fortunate to have so much to celebrate. My family, my wife Gia, my daughter Helen, and son Daniel, have known the Chan family for almost two decades. We have many happy memories that have helped it sustain us over these past few tragic weeks. Because both Scott and I shared a love for teaching, I've been asked to speak about Scott's physics teaching life. I like to think one reason Scott decided to take up teaching was that he saw how much fun I was having, and also apparently Lou has a lot of fun too. <laughs> I was positive Scott would be a great teacher. He was creative, caring, brilliant. He had an encyclopedic mind. <coughs> Back in the days where he could have an argument about trivia without somebody Googling it on their phone. It was a risky venture to bet against Scott. I learned that the hard way when I had to pay for dinner up at Tahoe. Turns out that giant pandas are a part of the bear family and not members of the raccoon family at all. Who, who knew? <laughs> Scott knew. Scott plunged wholeheartedly into the process of becoming a teacher. He observed classes at Mountain View High and took physics classes at Foothill College to update his knowledge. His professor at Foothill was David Marasco, Marasco, who I've known for many years. According to David, Scott helped teach the other students and was very patient with them. So he wasn't really there learning physics, he was there also practicing uh, the craft of teaching. Uh, Scott did his student teaching at Westmont High School. His master teacher, uh, Bill Taylor is also a friend of mine who also loves to dive. Bill is diving in South Africa right now, or else he would be here. Bill was amazed and, and somewhat intimidated by Scott's ability to develop engaging activities for his students. Scott did have an unfair advantage though. He had a Lotus, a McLaren, and a Tesla. <laughs> the students never tired of learning about the physics of Scott's fast cars. <laughs> Scott started his professional teaching career at Sarah High, where he taught with another friend of mine, Eric Platt. By this time, Scott may have started to think I was spying on him. At Sarah, Scott showed his commitment to being prepared every day, and for the day after that, and the day after that. He put great effort into developing a special demo or trick 
that he surprised his classes with every day. This kept them paying attention, waiting for that day's treat. Of course, it often involved looking at the physics of cars, more specifically, one of his fast ones. Scott found a good home at American High School. I could tell that his principal who hired him, Stephen Musto, knew him well when he said Scott's approach to teaching was exciting, engaging, and student-centered. He also said Scott had a knack for explaining physics concepts to students that grounded them in real world, world settings, like, of course, fast cars. <laughs> I believe Scott's teaching career will have the greatest lasting impact of all of his professional achievements, even after hearing uh, what we just heard. Challenger astronaut Krista McAuliffe was another great teacher taken too soon by tragedy. She famously said, I touch the future, I teach. Taking into account the profound influence I know Scott had on his students, Scott no, not only touched the future, he grabbed the future by the hand and yanked it up a few rungs. Scott was an enthusiastic and valued member of the physics teaching community. He attended and contrib contributed to our local professional conferences and workshops. Scott joined online discussion groups and was generous with his time and advice. Uh, when many teachers were enjoying their summer just this last August, uh, there was Scott giving advice about textbooks to a rookie teacher on the College Board online forum. I've had many teachers over the past few weeks share how Scott helped them and how they enjoyed spending time with him at our November 2nd conference at Foothill College. The physics teaching community will honor and remember Scott Chan, who always wore this shirt when he came to the conferences. I was stumped about how to end my tribute to Scott. As I was staring blankly into the distance, hoping for inspiration, a George Harrison song came on the radio. It was as if Scott was helping me find closure. I would like to end with George's words. Sunrise doesn't last all morning. A cloudburst doesn't last all day. Seems my love is up and has left me with no warning. But it's not always going to be this gray. All things must pass. All things must pass away. Hello, uh, my name is Irina. Um, as one of Kendra's closest friends growing up, I'd like to share some memories of our friend group's times together that stuck with us. Uh, Annie, Lisa, Anna, Helen, Jasmine, Kendra, and I, most of us started becoming really close around junior high and earlier, and only continued to grow our friendships as the years went on, half our lifetimes now. Times we had together were filled with pool parties in Kendra's backyard, most of us um, enjoying sleepovers in her basement. The late time chats we had brought us closer together. For prom, we came up with all these exotic plans for what to do afterwards, and then just ended up watching Lion King in Lisa's living room, because that's just how we were. When we grew older, even when we were physically apart, we stayed connected through video group chats. We will always remember each time we went camping with Kendra and how she would Dave Nattenborough us through hikes by pointing out different plants and birds along the way. Or how last New Year's we spent the majority of the night putting together an underwater themed puzzle and then going tide pooling in the moonlight. I remember helping dye Kendra's hair for the first time to a dark red and how afterwards the bathtub resembled a crime scene and we just sat there laughing on the floor for what seemed like forever. Two years ago we dressed up for New Year's and belted out karaoke songs around the bonfire near the ocean and in the morning heading to Santa Cruz to go tide pooling again. Um, this year she was my Valentine's date and we went on a ghost tour in San Diego. Forever the best Valentine's date I could ever ask for. The last weekend I spent with her Lisa, Annie, Cody, and Kendra visited me in San Francisco. And as we were going to sleep, we noticed the light coming through the window onto my Himalayan uh, salt lamp. And Kendra said, you know, it's real salt, you can lick it. <laughs> and the night turned into all of us having a lick of my dirty salt lamp. <laughs> that last trip together ended in lots of long hugs and promises for future adventures. I will miss collecting 
sea glass with her, discussing novels we would give to each other, gushing over rom-coms, and crying together while finishing an entire bag of cheddar sour cream ruffles. Um, all our tennis tournaments, our days filled with skiing, hiking, running, dancing together even when there was no music on. <sighs> Drinking tea together and just enjoying each other's company. She had such an immeasurably positive impact in all of our lives. It is so expansive how many experiences she shared with us through the years. It's hard to put into words how truly amazing Kendra is. She was and is incredible. She was always teaching and learning, loving and giving. From her time to her knowledge to the pure joy she radiated and infected us all with when she made a joke and cracked herself up or discovered a rare abalone on the beach. She was always moving, going on these incredible adventures. I know she inspired many to do the same. I know for myself, she has always pushed me to continuously explore and widen my view of the world and the effect I have on it. These are just some of the many qualities I learned from her. It affects all the relationships I keep with the people that are in my life and the way that I carry myself. She was my role model. I followed her to UC Davis, to Portland, back to the Bay Area, and eventually we had a plan to live in the same area and see each other all the time. I still wish I could do that. I'm still really sad. I'm sad every day and I'm learning more and more that there's a lot to be happy about for knowing her. It's better to have known her and had a chance to experience her and that realization has been sinking into me. There is so much of her I will keep with me. Thinking of her reminds me to enjoy every moment and live life to the fullest. I'm really stubborn about that and she was the same way but it worked out very well because she was uncompromising and living her best life. She was doing what she wanted to do and enjoying every moment of it. Thank you.